So today what I'd like to talk about is one portion of the electromagnetic spectrum and hopefully we'll explore the rest of this vast regime in future videos. Lights! <laughs> so what we have here is the optical portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. This is of course the rainbow that's familiar to everyone. Uh, our colors going from red to yellow to, to green to blue, indigo, violet. And as we progress through the rainbow, the energies associated with the photons of light um, get higher and higher and the wavelengths get smaller and smaller. Light is simply ripples in the electromagnetic field. The wavelength or the size of those ripples uh, governs the energy and the, hence the color of the resulting light. But what we see here in the optical regime, what our eyes are sensitive to is only a tiny fraction of the story. In fact, the electromagnetic spectrum stretches all the way from x-rays to radio, covering in between the ultraviolet, the infrared, gamma rays, all sorts of other different regimes that we may not necessarily think of as being light, but certainly are, and certainly are of use to us as astronomers. But by focusing in on only one portion of the spectrum, it's as if we're limiting ourselves, to borrow an analogy from another astronomer, David Helfand, it's as if we're only hearing one section of an orchestra when listening to the symphony. So as astronomers, we like to exploit multi-wavelength astronomy. We like to hear the whole orchestra in play. But by listening to the various different instruments, by isolating the various different wavelengths, we can learn different things about the objects that we're looking at. So the part of the spectrum we want to talk about today is actually the invisible bit off the end of here. So as we go past the blue and the indigo and the violet, we get to the ultraviolet. We get to wavelengths that are too small for our eyes to be able to see. Although some people with a medical condition called aphakia, where they're missing a lens in their eye, actually are able to see wavelengths down in this regime and see in the ultraviolet. Lights! Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the sun, of course, radiates at all wavelengths. Um, but the amount of light that gets down to us here on the ground varies according to wavelength. And that's a good thing, because although most of the light in the optical regime from the sun makes it all the way down to the ground, and we can see it with our eyes, the ultraviolet light is largely blocked by the atmosphere. And that's a good thing for us, because the energetic photons in the ultraviolet are bad for our health. They cause sunburn, they cause cancer, and we want that layer of the atmosphere covering us and protecting us from those energetic rays. So that's not to say that UV light is entirely bad. In fact, we need some of it. We need UV photons to create vitamin D in our skin. That's the only, we don't get vitamin D from our food. So we need sun ex some sun exposure in order to be healthy. UV light has lots of other practical applications. It can be used in medical diagnostics. It can be used to monitor hygiene. You may have seen in crime dramas, UV black lights being used to, um, to see splatters of blood or bodily fluids on, on, on crime scenes. We can also have a lot of fun with it because there's lots of, of ordinary household objects that actually glow when put under UV light. This is called a black light. Oh yeah. Well, you're seeing, you're seeing light coming out in the visible because the, the, the the lamp is not perfectly emitting in the UV, but it, it does have some filters that blocks out most of the visible light. But we can actually make that ultraviolet light visible using a process called fluorescence. Okay, lights, Paul. Thanks, mate. So many ordinary objects undergo a process called fluorescence. They absorb this invisible light and emit it at wavelengths that we can actually see. And you can actually have a lot of fun with this. So historically, for a long time, physicists have known that the substance quinine, is it quinine or quinine? I don't actually know. For a long time, physicists have known that the substance called quinine fluoresces under UV light. And of course, quinine is a very important ingredient in tonic water, which is a very important ingredient in gin and tonics. So I have a bottle of, of tonic water here. So we'll stick it under the UV light. Here we go, I'll put the tonic water under the UV light. And if we turn off the lights, we get a terrific glow. And what's happening here is that the energetic photons from the ultraviolet are being absorbed by the molecules of quinine. And electrons in those molecules are being excited to a higher energy level. Once they're there, they start losing energy again. First they lose it a bit 
through vibrational energy, and that's possibly really emitted as heat. And so by the time they fall back to their ground state, they don't have as much energy to get rid of. And so the energy they emit is lower energy than the energy they absorbed. And that means the wavelength is longer, so while they've absorbed ultraviolet light, they emit light in the optical. And in this case, we get this lovely bluey green glow. Lights? <laughs> so of course you can have some fun with this because you can start making things with tonic water. Um, so last night I whipped up um, a, a, a batch of lime green jelly or jello for our North American viewers. Uh, and we can see again if we put that under the black light. Lights? So on the left we have jelly made with the tonic water and on the right we have jelly made with just ordinary water. And you can see the difference. The, the, the tonic water continues to fluoresce even though it's in the jelly. Lights? <laughs> All right. But quinine is not the only substance that fluoresces under UV light that you can find in your kitchen. Uh, in fact, olive oil is another good thing to have a look at. And so what I've done here is I've taken some olive oil and you can see it's quite a green color. And that's because I've infused it with some mint, which is going to make this effect even more spectacular. And so you note, it's the same sort of greeny color as the jelly is. But when we put it under the black light, we'll see something quite different. So lights. So now you can see that instead of glowing greeny blue, it's growing this beautiful shade of red. And the reason it's doing that is because of the chlorophyll in the olive oil and in the mint that I've added. And so again, we're, we're seeing the same phenomenon. We're seeing fluorescence, energetic ultraviolet photons being absorbed, being re-emitted at lower energies, at longer wavelengths. In this case, the wavelength is long enough that it comes out as red. So I discovered that particular secret thanks to our lab guru, Paul, who it, told me the story of going through a supermarket with an, a UV black light to find the, the freshest olive oil because this effect doesn't last very long. You can have even more fun in games because you can buy commercial paint and um, skin pigments that allow you to do fun effects uh, under the black light. So again, I've got some face paints here. And if we turn the lights off, you can see the fantastic colors. So put together these face paints and glow in the dark jelly shots and you can have a really good party. Of course, you can get marker pens that allow you to write invisible messages that can only be seen under, under black light as well. So we had some fun playing with those. Light. Uh, lights. So this is all fun and games, but to an astronomer, UV light is really important because in the universe, ultraviolet light is generated by hot young stars and other extreme objects like supermassive black holes. Um, so we use ultraviolet telescopes, which we have to position above the Earth's atmosphere because otherwise none of the light is going to get to us. And we use these satellites to image the universe and collect those ultraviolet photons. And that can give us a really different picture of what the universe looks like. In my own research, I mostly work on clusters of galaxies, which are made up of collections of stars that are old and red and past sort of the active phase of their life, um, so there's not a lot of ultraviolet flux coming from those galaxies. But when I look at the same field using an ultraviolet telescope like the Galax telescope, my galaxies disappear. They become invisible and I can't see them. But what I do see is where there are sites of intense star formation, where massive hot stars, many times the mass of our own sun, are being born, living for only a few million years, before dying possibly in a supernova explosion, leaving behind a black hole.